Welcome to Shrimp Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture of literature. I'm Adrian Ford, and we are here for what will be in the Poetry Discussion Playlist, a video that will be in the Poetry Discussion Playlist, but also we're here for the 8th, the 7th, on the 9 days of Halloween. I have done three videos of Poe, four videos of Poe so far, including The Telltale Heart, The Mask of the Red Death, The Conqueror Worm, um, and some Stephen King in this lead-up to Halloween, so be sure to check those out on the channel if you have not already. But today we are here to discuss the story Bells by Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, this is my Edgar Allan Poe book. It doesn't look very impressive, but it is fitting. It's more impressive from that angle, right? Poe was a very busy, busy guy. So, this is a poem which is broken up into four sections, and uh, we probably better get right into it, because what we're going to do is we're going to read the poem, and then we're going to get into a little bit of analysis. But the analysis that I have for this poem today is maybe, maybe misguided, maybe misguided. Bells. Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells, what a world of merriment their melody foretells. How they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in the icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle. What a crystalline delight, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, the tintin the tintinabulation that so musically wells from the bells, 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 from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells, too. Hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells, what a world of happiness their harmony foretells. Through the balmy air of night, how they ring out their delight from the molten golden notes and all in tune. What a liquid ditty floats to the turtle dove that listens while she gloats on the moon. Oh, from the sounding cells, what a gush of euphony voluminously wells. How it swells, how it dwells on the future, how it tells of the rupture that impels to the swinging of the ringing of the bells, bells, bells. Of the bells, 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 to the rhyming and the chiming of the bells. Three. Hear the loud alarum bells, brazen bells, what a tale of terror now their turbulency tells. In the startled ear of night, how they scream out of a fright. Too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek, shriek out of tune in a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire, in a mad expostulation with the deaf and frantic fire, leaping higher, 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 with a desperate desire, and now a resolute endeavor, now, now to sit, or never. By the side of the pale-faced moon, oh, the bells, 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 what a tale their, what a tale their terror tells of despair. How they clang and clash and roar, what a horror they outpour. On the bosom of the palpitating air, by the twanging and the clanging, how the danger ebbs and flows, yet the ear distinctly tells in the jangling and the wrangling how the danger sinks and swells, by the sinking or the swelling in, anger, in the anger of the bells, of the bells, of the bells, 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 bells bells in the clamor and the clangor of the bells four hear the tolling of the bells iron bells what a word of solemn thought their melody compels in the silence of the night how we shiver with affright at the melancholy menace of their tone for every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan and the people ah the people that they they that dwell up in the steeple, all alone, and who to tolling, 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 in that muffled monotone, I feel a glory in so rolling, in the human heart a stone. There are neither man nor woman, there are neither brute nor human, they are ghouls. And their king it is who tolls. 
and he rolls, 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 a peon from the bells, and the merry bosom swells, and the peon and the bells, and he dances, and he yells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, to a peon of the bells, of the bells, keeping time, 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 in a sort of runic rhyme, through the throbbing of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the sobbing of the bells, keep time, 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 as he knells, 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 in a happy runic rhyme, to the rolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to the tolling of the bells, of the bells, 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 to a moaning and a groaning of the bells. This is one of Edgar Allan Poe's best known poems. But I would, I would venture so far as to wager it is not one of his best loved poems. I think that this is a poem that often finds its way into an English class or two because the professor finds something like the Raven or um, whatever you want to throw out there with Poe. The professor or the teacher would find that so uh, cliche or sing-songy or whatever it is there is and i think just personally i think part of the intelligentsia's um, bias against poe is that if you are a reader or even a writer you probably have 14 or 15 of these things sitting around because everyone who knows you everyone who meets you and decides they have to get you a gift for christmas or your birthday or whatever you get edgar Allan poe people gift you edgar Allan poe when you were a reader for sure and i think even if you were a writer and maybe just if you're a writer and kind of a weird guy guilty and that is what happens so i want to go it is part three of this poem with which i have some difference of opinion than what you normally hear. So I am going to, I'm going to put this poem into what I think are likely the effects of their, their sections. That first section there, hear the sledges of the, with the bell, silver bells, what a world of merriment they're melody foretells how they tinkle 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 in the icy air of night just off the top of my head if i if i'm taking that into account that picture into account those are those are christmas bells to me they are in in the in the winter air silver bells they are there for celebration they are there for the merriment of another year survived. But there's other... Th so, the invocation of silver. Silver is valuable. Silver would be ornamental. Because of these things, I think that this is a representation of childhood. If you think of your favorite Christmas memories, unless you're a parent, probably is from your childhood. So, the interesting thing to me here, if, you, if this is a poem which starts in childhood, we're automatically looking for a linear sort of unfolding of the poem and i think we get that but when you are talking about childhood you are talking about being in someone else's world you're not running things you're not in control of anything you there you have an external locust of control things are outside 
your grasp. And I think if we think of, if we if we start putting these things all of these elements together, silver is valuable, but it's not the most valuable. Childhood is fun, but you're not in any control. You're in someone else's world. Okay, those are elements that, that we can, I think, extract from this first section of the poem. The second section of the poem here. Hear the, meadow, hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells. What a world of happiness their harmony foretells. Through the balmy air of night, how they ring out their delight. Okay, from the molten golden notes. You've got golden in, in, invocated a couple times. So, childhood, though, you're talking three, right? Some people have memories from three on. So, three to, say, 14-ish, as you're, you're really sort of a kid there. Here, we have wedding bells. Now, it's a little bit different in our time, but during the time of Poe, it would not have been egregious for people to be married at 15. So you're looking really, I think, here with this section of the poem at a capstone, at hallmarks between 15 and 25 years old. And you're looking at gold. You're looking at golden bells. You have the most potential in this section of life of any time you will have. Gold is not just valuable. It's the most valuable, really, especially at this time. You didn't, you didn't have all of the, uh, the smaller elements uh, the palladium and platinum that would have been anywhere near as valuable as gold, at least not, not that I know of. I don't think that started until more recently. So you're talking about the promise of life. You're talking about a very fruitful stage in life. But marriage is also, it, it, marriage is joy. But marriage is also responsibility. And here we have another reason for the symbol of gold. If you're being married, you have to end up, you, you're coming into the life of your own. You have to figure that part out. That part being the money part of life. You have to start your adult life. You have to um, have someone to be with you. You have to provide. You have to create Marriage and adulthood are the start of your journey. This is an internal locust of control. So we've moved from silver, which is valuable, youth, valuable, to gold being the, the springing adulthood, which is more valuable. We have moved from the external locust of control to the internal locust of control. And we have gone from the 3 to 14 year old kind of area probably to 15 to 25 year old. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say that's sort of around an imposed world where these sorts of things were happening more often than uh, any other point in life? So, okay. Now, the third section is where I want to make my argument. So we're going to skip it for now. We're going to jump straight to section four. Section four, which was, hearing the tolling of the bells, iron bells, what a world of solemn their, th what a world of solemn thought their melody compels in the silence of the night. How we shiver with affright, at the melancholy menace of their tone. For every sound that floats from the rust within their throats, it is a groan, and the people, ah, the people. They that dwell up in the steeple all alone, and who tolling, 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 etc. I think that these are funeral bells. I think that's understandable. I don't think that's too... Um, I don't think that is too compelling an argument, because I think that it is something which would be fairly obvious if we're not trying to obfuscate the poem itself. Now, it doesn't outright tell us, I don't think, anywhere that these are funeral bells. But it would sort of make sense. Especially if we have accepted this linear 
sort of progress through the poem, this chronological progress through the poem. So you're looking here in this section, probably, uh, so iron, you're looking at iron bells, first off. Iron is not all that valuable. Now, it would have been much more valuable back in post time than it is today, at least on a, like a use by use basis. There, uh, so I worked, after graduating, I worked on a house that was built in the 1890s. And it had these, I don't think that these were original to the house. I think these were put in a little bit later. But they were these, I had to take out these great big um, iron vents, right? The the coils, the co what is, it's not a vent, but you know what I'm talking about. The, that's how they heated the house, was through that. Man, were those things heavy. Had to put, what, basically what I had to do was put a crowbar in one of them, brace that against my chest, put the other crowbar in here, and squeeze to crack them apart. There was a lot of work done with iron, but it was work. Iron was something which was final. Not really ornamental, but probably if you had iron in something. This was before the brutalist age that we live in now. So they would have a lot of this iron work was made up to look good, but it was final. So if we're talking about the age, so 35 to 65, I think we're talking about funeral bells. I don't think any of that is all that compelling. One thing which is interesting here, the life expectancy, if you were born in 1840, which was when Poe died, I think, the life expectancy was 40.2 years. Poe died right at 40. So there you have the 35 to 65 expectation here. But what we're also looking at, death is final. Death, your death, there is no locus of control. So what we've done is we have moved from childhood to adolescence to, to what I'm call, going to call adulthood in the third section to the end of life. And we have moved from external locus of control to internal locus of control. We're going to see what that next section is, right? It is necessitated, however, by this section. With death, there is no locus of control. Locus of control. So what do we have in that third section there? Well, I checked. I I don't always look around for um, other opinions on a poem or, or anything like that. In in fact, I kind of rarely do, simply because I want this. This is my channel. I don't think that you come here for everyone else's opinion on anything. If you were 18, 19 minutes into a poem, into a video about a poem by Edgar Allan Poe, and it's not even one of the, anyone's favorites, I think you've come here in order that we have this dialogue. But while I was looking, I didn't see any interpretations like the one that I'm giving. And I think this third section is the reason that there aren't, because I don't think it is as obvious, certainly as the first section, the Christmas bells, that says that screams Christmas bells to me, and not as overt as the second section where we are told these are wedding bells. And, you know, even here at the end, the funeral bells are only sort of hinted at. So what are we talking about in that third section? Well, let's, let's go ahead and read over the third section again. Hear the loud alarum bells, brazen bells, what a tale of terror, now their turbulency tells. In the startled ear of night, how they scream out of, out of their affright. Too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek 
shriek, out of tune in a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire, in a mad exp expostulation with the deaf and frantic fire, leaping higher, higher, higher with a desperate desire. What a resolute endeavor now, now to sit or never, by the side of the pale-faced moon. Oh, the bells, 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 what a tale their terror tells of despair. How they clang and clash and roar, what a horror they outpour on the bosom of the palpitating air. Yet the ear it fully knows by the twanging and the clanging how the danger ebbs and flows. Yet the ear distinctly tells in the jangling and the wrangling how the danger sinks and swells by the sinking or the swelling in the anger of the bells, of the bells. Of the bells, 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 in the clamor and the clangor of the bells. Okay. So we've got Christmas bells. We've got wedding bells. We have blank. And then we have funeral bells. I postulate, posit, hypothesize, these are war bells. I think that these are war bells, and that would fit in sort of with the rough time frame that we're talking about, 25 to 35. That is not an unnatural or um, crazy amount of time or timeline for a man to be fighting in war. I couldn't find any interpretations to corroborate this, but no metal is mentioned here. We are given brazen bells. Now, brazen is absolutely not the same word as bronze. But I think that if you are going to stretch things a little bit, it would there there could be some leeway there. Brazen bells, bronze and bells. The war bells um, analogy, I think, is, I want to defend it real quick. We get this from Legion magazine, quote, It was a long-standing tradition of European warfare that artillery commanders had rights over the bells of conquered villages, towns, and cities. So I don't think that this is unreasonable to call a war bell, because if, if a conqueror has, and th this would have been a world in which these rules of war were at least known, sort of the same way that we know when you hear the siren, if it's the first Wednesday of the month, you have nothing to worry about. Now, I live in the Midwest, siren, tornado sirens, I don't know if, where everyone has those. The first Wednesday of the month, we have sirens that go off. They're the tornado sirens. But if it's the first Wednesday of the month and you can look out and say, okay, well, uh, it's sunny. The sky is not green and nothing is flying past my window. It's just a test. These were, this is a practice. This is something, a rule of society, which is known. During the time of Poe, this rule of society would have been known. Now, why I think that is interesting why I think that is corroborative. When you think of Christmas bells, you think of the church. When you think of wedding bells, you're getting married at the church. When you think of funeral bells, where are you holding a funeral? Well, war bells would have likely been the church bells as well. What does war represent? War represents ideology. War represents idealism. It represents politics. And it represents being caught up in someone else's motive. If a conquering commander has control of your town's war bells, 
That means, probably, you are still going about your life, but someone else is controlling the time. Someone else is controlling the mechanism which lets you know that life is moving on. This would be a mixed locus of control. Sometimes I have my life, in, in the war metaphor, I have my life, but I am told when to do what. We are not in control of this society anymore, much in the same way that during the 25 to 35 stage of your life, you control a lot of the things that you do, but you are told when to be where and how to do it. You have to have a job during this time. So we've moved from external locus of control to internal locus of control. This is the seminal time of your life with the marriage to adulthood, full sprung adulthood where you understand that the best way to do things, you're in control sometimes, someone's telling you what to do sometimes. That's just how the world works. Uh, in this same section, uh, oh, to, to finally, no locust of control, because you're a goner. Now, idealism and politics. When you were thinking about the frantic, mad dash of your every day. You wake up at the alarm. You hop out of bed. You brush your teeth. Uh, maybe you eat something before work. Maybe you don't. Maybe you shower. Probably you don't. Because let's be honest, you're slovenly. Uh, it is too much to ask. We're here at the behest of someone else. We've woken up because we have to be somewhere when someone has told us at a specific time that we have to be there. Everything is a flutter. Everything is chaos. Then when we get off work, probably we have to stop at the gas station. Probably we have to do the laundry. Probably we gotta go pay rent. Probably we gotta pay the electric bill. Whatever it is right? Yeah, we have some choices, but we got to do all this stuff. There is a mixed locus of control. Now, when you think about that daily, the hectic daily circles in which we live, wake up, go to work, go get something to eat, come home, go to bed, wake up, Go to work, go get something to eat and do the laundry, come home. It's a circle we just live in, right? Hear the loud alarum bells, brazen bells, what a tale of terror now their turbulency tells. In the startled ear of night, how they scream out their affright. Too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek, shriek out of tune. In a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire, in a mad expostulation with the deaf and frantic fire, leaping higher, higher, higher with a desperate desire, and now a resolute endeavor, now, now, to sit or never, by the side of the pale-faced moon. Oh, the bells, 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 what a tale of terror, what a tale their terror tells of despair. The mass of men lead a, lead a life of quiet despair, right? How they clang and clash and roar, what a horror they outpour on the bosom of the palpitating air, yet the ear it fully knows by the twanging and the clanging, how the danger ebbs and flows, yet the ear distinctly tells in the jangling and the wrangling, how the danger sinks and swells by the sinking or the swelling in the anger of the bells, of the bells, of the bells, 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 in the clamor and the clangor of the bells. I think that bells is walking us step by step through life by the types of bells that we hear. That is all I have for this poetry discussion. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to have tomorrow. 
but I will be back with something, and then I will be back on Monday with chapter 14, I believe, of Fairy Tale by Stephen King. We are going chapter by chapter through that here on the channel as well, if you are not familiar with that playlist. And I hope to have you back for all the videos I do moving forward.